They say one man's junk is another man's treasure. What I know for sure is that you can make a lot of money by removing junk. If you don't believe me, then keep listening because you'll learn how even a high schooler can crush it in this niche. Here are some highlights from this episode. Why junk removal is a business you need to start in 2024. How to build a team of A players who are not afraid to get their hands dirty. And what's the secret of juggling your business and other pressing responsibilities. This is Ryan Atkinson, and you're listening to the Upflip Podcast, where we uncover the secrets of building and running successful businesses. Our guest today is a true business protege. Kirk McKinney started his company, Junk Teens, while in high school. Today, Kirk runs a crew of 15 and pulls close to a million dollars per year. The best part, he did that all while keeping up with his education, now in college, where he studies entrepreneurship. Kirk, welcome to the show. Super, super excited to have you on. Hey, how's it going? Super excited to have you here. I think our community really loves like entrepreneurs and like their story. So I'm super excited to peel that back for you. So let's kind of run back a few years when you started Junk Teams. What kind of led up to this moment about three and a half years ago? Yeah, so it didn't exactly start at Junk Teens. It all started actually from a bike ride on accident when I discovered the dump. So like, I never actually knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I was on an adventure with my friend and we used to ride bikes all the time. So we were on this bike ride and then we rode past the dump and I was like, hey, what's that? That looks really cool. So we went to explore it. And when we went there, I found this really nice set of speakers that someone had thrown away. And I couldn't believe that someone had thrown those in the trash. So I asked the guy like, hey, could I keep these? And he was like, oh yeah, of course. So I brought them home and they worked. I just couldn't believe it, you know? Like I loved speakers. It was like my passion with speakers at the time. I really loved audio equipment and I just couldn't believe this. So after that, I kept going back to the dump and finding more and more speakers and audio equipment that people would throw away. And then that basically led from one thing to another until my entire bedroom was full of speakers and my mom was not (laughs) happy. So she told me I had to throw it all away. I had to get rid of all of it, get it out of my room because my room looked like a dump. (laughs) And I mean, at this time, I was working at a grocery store making $12 an hour and I was like, I had worked so hard riding all these speakers home on my bicycle to fill up my whole room and I didn't want to just throw them away. So I thought outside the box, like, what could I do? That's when I sold my very first radio on Facebook Marketplace for $50 and that $50 was my first money I ever made working for myself and it was doing something that I actually loved. So then from there, I basically sold all the stuff in my room and that $50 I made like round trip was probably less than an hour. It was more fun than I ever had working at the grocery store. So now I was thinking like, hmm, I wonder if I could do this full time. So I didn't know for sure. So it was like a little bit longer, maybe a month or so. I kept selling things, selling radios from the dump until I realized that it was consistent and I could quit my job and start doing that full time. So then it went from selling radios that I would find at the dump to then selling anything I could find at the dump. And then the guys at the dump saw my hustle and they really respected how hard I worked. I would go there every single day that they're open from the minute that the dumps open till they close. And then after I would help the guys at the dump clean up so that they would start to save me stuff too. (laughs) Like I was just obsessed with finding junk because like you never know what you're going to find. And and it could be like the one minute you're not at the dump could be like the $500 item that you miss out on. So it's almost like you just like want to be there every second. And it was really fun. Then eventually those guys would save stuff for me. I would sell stuff, but they actually invited me to start removing junk with them. And that's where I was originally introduced to junk removal. And this was around like 2020 or 2021 around this time. And basically like we realized we needed a pickup truck to start selling more stuff and potentially do the like junk removal jobs on the side. The guys who showed me and let me work with them, they had no problem with us going and starting on our own. They actually supported us with that and they taught us the ropes. So we started doing little jobs on the side. Our first job was like moving a couch for like $100. Took us like 20 minutes. And like after that, the rest was history. We just like, we focused on junk removal because we made way more money than selling stuff. It was more reliable, more legitimate. And we honestly liked selling junk and removing it pretty much the same. So that's how we got into junk removal. 
I want to yeah. distill some stuff there uh, before we drive into the whole like junk teens. I think what's really cool is like you originally started this by just like flipping stuff. And like some people view flipping as like, I don't know, that's an easy way when you're young. I did it four or five years ago, just flipping clothes and flipping anything. I think that's a really cool way to actually get started with anything entrepreneurship. It's a building the foundation box of doing something. Yeah, exactly. And it all started from a passion too. Like I wasn't even looking for money. Like my mom was telling me to throw the stuff out, the stuff that I loved. I didn't even look at it like, oh, I have all this money in front of me, you know, but then it happened on accident. Yeah, I think that's really cool because you had that experience with like audio. And so, yeah, then it progressed a little bit into like actually doing the junk removal and like the dumps and like doing that stuff. So let's talk about then these guys are supporting you to go start your own thing. And that leads into junk teens. Can you kind of take us to those moments of like finding junk teens after working with junk removal for a little bit? Yeah. So then now we had this pickup truck, my brother and I, and we slowly grew our business. We were knocking on doors, giving out business cards to everybody, posting on Facebook, you know, like other social media platforms like Nextdoor, like whatever we could do to just start our business from the ground up. We did that for the first year and we worked a lot, especially during the summer. We worked probably seven to seven, like most days out of the week. There's definitely some weeks where we worked like seven days a week, seven to seven and just like going crazy because this was our dream and we loved it and we really wanted to build this business. So we didn't have any employees for the first year. It was just me and my brother. And then in that first year, we grew from like that first pickup truck for $4,000 until like ending the year, we made 120K with that pickup truck, just me and my brother removing junk and doing some little landscaping and moving stuff on the side. But yeah, we made 120K that year. And then now it's 2022. And this is when Junk Teens was born because we realized like, okay, now we're taking our business to the next level. We can't keep going with K and J removal and disposal because that's like your local business, like mom and pop. Like we want to go a little bit bigger than that. So we realized we needed a company, but not even just that, a brand. And we realized like people were hiring us because we were teenagers. So that's why we named the company Junk Teens. And then we went all in, reinvested like all the money we made back into the company by buying our first dump truck. Nice. Yeah. Then we used that to make a little bit more money, upgraded our pickup truck. So now this is 2022 and we had our first dump truck and a nicer pickup truck because also our first pickup truck, we beat it to death. The frame was cracked and like everything was really a shit box. So like we kind of like needed that upgraded truck too. So this is 2022. We worked with those two vehicles and we actually started hiring our friends now at this point. So maybe like I would go out in the dump truck and my brother, he still wasn't allowed to drive the dump truck. Yeah. I want to ask just to lay the groundwork here. Like how old are you guys like in 2021, 2022? Because I think that adds some pretty good perspective to the audience. Yeah. So we started when we were 15 and 17 years old. That's when we first bought the pickup truck. Now, 2022, it's like a year later. So it's 18 and 16. And like in the beginning of 2022, my brother still didn't have a license. So I was the only one that could drive. We never like hired anyone that was older than us either because like we just never really had anyone like that. It was just us. So then once my brother was able to drive, it was like he would go out in the pickup truck. I would go out in the dump truck. And then we would each have a friend with us. And that's kind of how we ran the business for most of that year. Then towards the end of the year, end of the summer, we started to get bigger jobs and we would have like more friends come, you know, and like still a lot of us running the business in 2022. But we ended off that year with those two vehicles making like 460K in sales. And it was also our first year experimenting with paid advertising too, but that was still mostly organic growth as well. Yeah, I want to talk about that because those are obviously huge numbers to hit. One, like in year two for any company, that is a ginormous number to hit. I don't want to like ageism you, but like that's like a very impressive feat. That is incredible. So kudos to you for that. So how are you getting most of your sales and most of the clients in year two when you guys are getting like $460,000 in sales? So we would maximize every single customer that we went to their house. We would like make sure that they put a post out on Facebook. We would make sure that they tell their friends, give them business cards and Google review 
cards so that they would like have a QR code to write the review. And we would just like spend our time reaching out to every single customer at the end of the day after the job and be like, hey, I just wanted to remind you that Facebook post or that Google review really would help our business. And like, because we're young entrepreneurs, they just want to help. So that reminder would like most of our customers would just go and do that thing to support our business. And it's like a lot of this is just word of mouth and us being persistent with the customers and them doing the marketing for us. We did some other little things like yard signs and we did experiment with a billboard that one was honestly for fun we didn't expect that it was going to bring us a high return but it was like three grand we kind of broke even on it (laughs) we didn't even do paid facebook ads or google or anything it was really just like yard signs billboard and like i think we tried paid next door ads but like nothing crazy still a lot of just like word of mouth persistency Can I get a drum roll, please? Because we are giving away a free lifetime access to the Academy for one lucky listener. And it's super simple to participate. All you need to do is leave us a review on Apple and then send us a screenshot as proof. Takes five minutes for lifetime access to the Outflip Academy for free. So two steps, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, send us a screenshot, and the link to participate is in the show notes below. If you are a wannabe entrepreneur, the courses in there are so invaluable for you to access actually get that first business idea off the ground. And then for the current business owners that are looking to sharpen their skills, there are a ton of courses in there for you. And the best part, you're going to be able to connect with other top-notch entrepreneurs in your field to network with them and learn from them. The winner will be announced on July 26th. All you need to do, leave us a review on Apple, send us a screenshot of proof, and you guys can find more details in the show notes below. So you guys are operating at this time in year two around just like the Boston area or where are you guys like operating at? Yeah. So this was like still running it out of the driveway, really. Nice. Uh, and like we would kind of go within like 30 mile radius. So we'd drive between like 30 and 45 minutes from our hometown to do jobs. I mean, if it's a big job, we'll go further like an hour. But like most of the time, it's like 30, 45 minutes. And that's how far we would go. Interesting. So how are you deciding? Let's just say someone's an hour away and you're like, eh, that's a little far, but of course, a certain price point, we will do it. So how do you guys currently price? Because if someone's listening, they're like, holy shit, this is impressive because this is impressive. And they want to think about pricing. How do you guys price then? So we would have our normal rate. Like, let's just talk about first, like if it's out of our service area, I'm going to add like what our time is worth onto that. So if it's an extra like 10 20 minute drive for us and like that's back and forth that might be a total of a 30 minutes extra maybe we'll add a hundred bucks on we'll just kind of figure out like okay how out of the way is this job how much are we willing extra to do it for and then we'll do that but if it's like a big job for like two or three grand like we'll probably just price it normally but like how we do our normal pricing is like we just realized like in the beginning what are people paying for their service we also called local junk removal companies and figure out what they're pricing at most companies charge by the truckload, but that's not what we're doing. We're going to possibly start doing that soon, but we just charge by the job and look at our pricing sheet and like kind of all the jobs that we've done before. It's like, okay, someone's going to pay a hundred bucks for this pile here. So like now we have the customer send us a picture. If there's like a hundred dollars worth of junk in that pile, it's like, okay, we'll take care of this for a hundred dollars. But there's obviously like a lot of other factors, like where's the junk located? How heavy is it? How far out of the service area are you? There's also specific items like mattresses, TVs, tires. Those are all separate fee at the dump. So like we have to add that on with the pricing sheet to the total job. But in junk removal, to keep it simple, it's like you really want to price based on volume. So if we went based on truckload, our truckload price would be like anywhere from like 1400 to two grand because our trucks are massive. Like the industry standards, usually like 15 to 20 cubic yards. Ours are like 26 cubic yards. So much bigger. Let's keep progressing to your story too, because I think it's an interesting story. So year two, we do about 460,000. This is 2022. Let's transition to 2023. What were some big things that you guys did in 2023 that really helped move the needle? Is it hiring? Is it marketing differently? Like, What were some things you guys did in 2023? So the third year, we did a lot of things. We outgrew the driveway and we also had enough money to now reinvest into our second dump truck because the demand was getting higher for our service. So we got a second dump truck. We rented a warehouse so that we would have a place to store all these trucks. And then 
we also started to like trust our friends to drive these trucks. Now that we're all getting a little bit older, we know the business better. We've experimented with the business model and kind of know what works now. We are familiar with the business. Now we can start to train our friends to go out there and remove junk. So now we have three trucks and like my brother and I can't even drive those all day. No, we have to have someone go out. It's not even like we had a choice. It's just like we had to do this because we're growing so big now. So that's what we did with like the operations. But like in terms of marketing, this is when we started paid advertising. We still really haven't spent any money on Google ads since the beginning of our business. We might've experimented once with like a thousand dollars, but actually going to do Google ads like right now. I have a guy who's starting that with us. So that this year could take our business to like a whole nother level. But we started doing paid Facebook ads. We started going a little bit more consistent with the yard signs. And overall, just like when you do things right, over time, the business will grow. If you don't take shortcuts and, you know, like if you dump the junk in the woods, that's not going to get you to the million dollar mark. If you cut corners like that, it's just going to prevent you from ever getting to that level. So we just kept doing things right. Customers and people saw that and they just like, you know, like the word of mouth just continued along with that paid advertising and just like really taking everything more seriously. That's how we were able to grow in our third year more towards that million dollar mark. It's really cool. And what I'm like really taking away from this is like the customer testimonials, like do customer testimonials, get customer testimonials. We had a conversation with someone today who was saying the same thing, like how they grew their business was all through customer testimonials. And it's kind of speaking to true to like what you're saying is like, that was a huge lever for you guys. Yeah. One other thing too, is that junk removal is extremely competitive because like anyone can just go get a pickup truck or like literally a U-Haul or just anything and go do it. So another thing we did was just like, be very persistent with communication. So like a lot of the times people would hire us because we got back to them 10 minutes before the other company did. And like people need this stuff usually done a lot quicker. So like my brother's on the phone 24 seven, just like picking up phone calls, texting people back. And like all of that just led towards more people hiring us over the other guys. And I want to talk a little bit about the leadership style too, because I think it's really interesting to be running such a high revenue company at like your age and like how you did it too, I think is interesting with like hiring your friends. Can you talk to us about like the challenges you had as like running a company, but like also like hiring your friends? Like how did you balance that? How do you balance that? I mean, if anything, it makes it easier because you get to work with your friends. So it doesn't even feel like you're working a lot of the times. So that's definitely one thing. But like, it's also easier because like everyone at school kind of knows each other. So it's like you get one kid to come in and they're going to get five of their friends to come in. Five of their friends are going to get five of their friends. You know, like you kind of just start reaching out to people. But another thing we did in our third year is only have the top talent come in. So if somebody is not like the best, we'll try them out for a day, see how they do. But like, we're not just going to let like anyone come into work because it's cheaper. Like we pay people very fair. We don't penny pinch, you know, like we go above and beyond pay people what they're worth. And then we only want to keep the best and the best brings the best too. So that's how we started to work with our friends and manage that. Interesting. Have you guys had like mentorship to help you like make some of these decisions? Can you speak to us a little bit about the mentorship that you've received? That's a great question. So in the very beginning, it was the guys from the dump because that's like how we learned the business and the opportunity and got to work in it and see what it was like, see that it worked for us as well in our specific situation. But as we scaled, all of our customers wanted to support us. And when you're going to like five or 10 houses a day, you just end up meeting so many people. And like some of those people would just give us feedback, which would help us grow. Some of these people had really nice houses and like we would talk with them. But also... Our parents for 30 years have owned a tree business and grew that from the ground up after they graduated from college. So from the beginning, our parents have always given us advice. The one thing that they never gave us was money. Like they didn't buy stuff for us. And we're very thankful that they didn't buy anything for us because that is what taught us how to actually build the business ourselves from the ground up, which will allow us to continue to scale. Because I feel like if they were to buy something for us, we wouldn't feel really the pain of having to get that money to buy that thing. And it's like, it's really important, but they've given us a lot of advice on like leadership and like training people, dealing with problems, equipment, our parents have been huge. And then recently, there's another guy in our area that has like a pretty big tree service also might have like 
20 different vehicles going out full time. And like, we've learned a lot about leadership and like scaling big with that guy. Now, I'm also a student at Babson College as well. And like, I hear a lot of guest speakers and CEOs come in there, like the founder of Home Depot. He's also the owner of the Atlanta Falcons. A lot of very qualified people just come at Babson and speak. A lot of like CEO Bank America, the CEO of New Balance, just a lot of people. So I hear a lot of very common things amongst the people at the top in this environment. So that's another way, as well as surrounding myself with like a strong and driven community of people myself. So it's just like all those things coming together, I would say is the mentorship that we get that helps us. Yeah, I feel like mentorship for me is like a really big thing as well as like having someone that has built a business before and also like can give that feedback that you need. And like if you need like hiring questions or like, oh, what metrics should we be tracking all that good stuff. Another thing too is like when you're young and you're running a business, you end up meeting a lot of other young business owners too. And like you kind of just share problems, situations, ideas, and opportunities with each other. That's just another thing that just really has helped us from the beginning. Yeah, because that's basically getting like a mastermind together of like like minded people that can share experiences, especially when you're building a company that's young. I mean, I'm 25 as well. Like it's hard. Like running a company is like one of the hardest things. It is the hardest thing I've ever done. So being able to relate to other young entrepreneurs that will have other personal interests with you as well is like a huge win overall. I also want to talk about as we think about other young people, I want to continue on this thread. What advice would you give to other people that want to start their own business, but like don't really know where to start? Yeah, a lot of people, when they first look at starting a business, they look at it like it has to be some big thing like, oh, I need an investment. I need these resources, this and that. But like a lot of people look way too big when in reality, you literally just have to start and start with whatever you have access to. And that's the best thing you can do for yourself. Because if you like try to go and get other people's money to start. In my opinion, like that's way more risky because a lot of the lessons that it would take for you to understand how to work with that kind of money, you're not going to have those through your own experience that like made you that money. So it's like just literally start with what you have. And obviously every industry is different, but for us in junk removal or like a lot of different trades, you can start with like literally nothing and just start developing skills, meeting people and like going from there. So like if someone's looking to get started in junk removal specifically too, it's just like, just start. That's my advice. Yeah, I say it a lot. The difference between a wannabe preneur and an entrepreneur is the people that actually do start and take action. And that is the most true thing ever. But Kirk, let's go down to our fan blitz questions where we have five questions for you that actually comes from our community. And guys, if you want to join the conversation, ask Kirk questions or any entrepreneur's questions, you guys can go to youtube.com slash upflip and submit your questions there. But ready to wind us out with our last five questions? I'm ready. Number one, how do you avoid getting sick from mold and all the debris that blow out things when you're moving? Yeah. So if there's ever a tricky job where we're in like an attic, you know, we don't deal with asbestos or anything crazy like that. So if we know that that is present, we won't even touch that job. But in some situations, if like a piece of furniture has some mold on it or like some minor things, we do have like the respirators, the heavy duty ones, we have face masks. So we'll throw those on. But a lot of the times it's pretty obvious if it is going to be like something toxic and we will just stay away from those jobs because we really prioritize our health too. Number two, how do you handle it when you have loaded something or are loading something and someone changes their mind? That does happen sometimes, not as often as you think, but there's been times where like we brought stuff to the dump, the customer reaches out to us and they're like, hey, I didn't want you to get rid of that. And it's like, at that point, there's literally nothing we can do. But if it's important, like we will go back to the dump and search for it. We'll call the dump and ask if they can find that thing. But if it's that far gone, there's not a whole lot we can do. And there has been situations where we found stuff or it's just gone. And like, if it's in the truck and we're at the house, we'll dig through the truck and find it. But it's not super common. What is the breakdown of things you recycle and what are the most profitable categories? The breakdown of like what we dispose of, I would say it's like you have general trash, then you have wood because here in Massachusetts, they're much more strict with the recycling laws. So like they make you separate like way more things. There's no landfills here. It's all transfer stations. So you have to sort through every little piece of item. So for us, it's like trash, wood, and then metal. It's really, if you want to keep it simple, junk, and then metal. Metal can be recycled and you get paid for that. And then trash, you have to pay by the ton to dispose of that. So they charge you based on the weight to get rid of it. 
And then there's all the odd items like recyclable items like mattresses, propane tanks, tires, TVs, anything with Freon in it like air conditioners, refrigerators, all the odd items like that. That's like a whole separate category. And I'd just say like miscellaneous recyclable items. So that's what I'd break it up to. I like it. Number four is the money mostly earned from recycling the trash. How does the trash get sorted efficiently to recycle as much as possible? Yeah. So like, it's all about like the disposal process of like which state you live in. For us, it's much easier to recycle because that's how the system is kind of operated around here. There's recycling facilities. They make you sort it. We also have a warehouse too, like I mentioned, and we bring the reusable stuff here and we do sell some of that. We don't make a whole lot of money. It like doesn't really cover the rent because it's that's like a whole nother business, really. We're just trying to like not have everything go into the dump. So we just bring as much to recycle and save as we can here. And the money isn't made from the actual recycling recycling itself it's from getting paid from the customer that wants you to take it off their property and like when it comes to recycling we get a little bit of money from scrap metal a little bit of money from selling stuff but that really doesn't contribute to anything major at all i like it then last one for you what marketing strategies are the most effective to use in the beginning Mm, i definitely went over like most of them in the beginning but i would say using facebook joining local groups, having your mom's friends promote you on their pages. (laughs) And yard signs are huge too. Like they really do work. They're not always legal everywhere, but like those are great. Apps like Nextdoor, like local neighborhood apps. And of course, word of mouth is the most powerful and it just takes more work. So like people always want something easier and they're expecting me to give them some secret to like marketing. But in reality, it's about being persistent with your customers and really providing above and beyond service all the time. And you'll grow a successful business by doing that. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. Three quick takeaways for you. Number one, if you are going to do this, this is a very, very scrappy job. This is not something that you just get to take your cold brew, sit in an AC and do. You're actually moving and grooving here. So if you're going to do this, definitely make sure you're going to do this scrappy. Number two, get customer testimonials. That is like the number one thing we talk about on this show is that if you're going to succeed, you're going to need customer testimonials. And three, what I thought was really interesting is his perception on having friends and working where it actually makes the work way more enjoyable. There is that fine line, of course, but having friends at work who are your friends already can make work like this way more enjoyable. So for more inspiration, check out episode 85 of the podcast where we speak with Kyle Landwer about where he started to scale his $2 million junk removal business at the age of 22. The link is in the show notes below. Awesome. Well, Kirk, thank you so much for joining today's episode, guys. Go check out that for all things junk removal, junk teens, everything like that. So Kirk, thank you so much for being here today. Awesome. Thank you. I had a great time. Thank you.